Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about family entertainment, um, specifically, you know, think of in, thinking of it in App Store terms, um, the kids category within the App Store. Um, because the kids category, as we know, is not just games, but it's sort of generally entertainment products. Some of them consist of video, you know, led products. Some, there's education products, books, learning, etc., all together in the kids category because um, from a merchandising standpoint, the kids category is sort of a relatively unique beast. But <clears throat> first, let me start with a little bit of background on us. Um, we are a Hong Kong-based developer and publisher. Uh, we've been around since 2009. We publish globally. Um, and we're best known, I think, for um, publishing games based upon licensed intellectual property. So we work with a lot of very well-known brands, um, characters from anime or toys, etc. Um, many of them from Japan and Korea and North America, and create games, original game content, based upon those brands. Um, and so that's kind of our specialty. Um, now, looking at family entertainment generally, what does family entertainment mean? Okay, I think historically, family entertainment, um, at least in the West, had very much this idealized stereotype of the family sitting around watching television together, you know, the TV was a very small black and white box. Um, and today, that's slightly different. You know, obviously, we have streaming video services, big flat screen TVs, and what looks here on the right-hand side like maybe an IKEA showroom that they're sitting in. Um, but I think this is an idealized view, because if you guys are anything like my house, um, often it looks a little bit more like this, where we are kind of all alone together, because everybody's on their second screen, and spending time on mobile devices, even if they do have a television on in front of them as well. Um, so this is very much you know, the situation in my house, with the exception of the white people. Um, so <clears throat> if moving on, we talk about uh, family entertainment, um, I want to talk a little bit about devices first. Because when it comes to family entertainment, um, there's both single player entertainment, so kids playing by themselves, there's also kids playing with their friends and other kids, and kids playing with their parents. And these are all different constituencies that we have to think about how to cater to. Um, and what you'll notice as a commonality amongst most of these images, or frankly any image, you know, you just do a Google search for children's gaming, and you're going to see tablets. Tablets are a critical part of the entertainment diet when it comes to mobile and kids. So if we look at some of the statistics, and these come from, oops, sorry, my screen is over there. These come from Ofcom in the UK. <clears throat> um, if we look at children between the ages of 5 and 15 and device consumption, we see that about 34% of kids under the age of 15 have their own tablet device. Um, and so 42% of them use tablets to go online. So a key part of their online experience is actually accessing the internet through a tablet device. So it's natural that when they start to consume apps and games, this also happens on a tablet device. Now, I'd like to point to one other trend. Remember, this is kids between the age of 5 and 15. If we look at young children, again in the UK, um, this is children under 5, 31% of them own their own tablet device. And of children under 3, 25% of them own their own tablet device, okay? And the majority of them actually tend to be iPads um, as opposed to Android devices. So we see very strong tablet ownership. And keep in mind, these statistics are now two years old. These are from 2014. So we'll get 2015 statistics hopefully sometime soon. Um, and that will continue to increase because in 2013, it was about 19% of kids between 5 and 15 had their own tablet compared to 34% in 2014. So the rate of growth of penetrations of tablets into younger and younger children's hands as being their own device is increasing quickly. And this is a change from the original trend. When the iPad first came out, parents shared their iPad with their kid. It was an adult device. The kid asked for the device and said, please, can I borrow your iPad? I want to play games. And then the parent lent the kid the device. Then. The second stage of the evolution was that parents went out and got a new device for themselves and gave the old device to their children to use. Now that's changed. Children are getting primary devices. They're saying, Mom, Dad, I want my own device. We go out to the store and they buy them a device, dedicated device for themselves. 
So I think we're going to, we're fast approaching sort of ubiquity where parents, uh, where kids will all have their own tablet devices. So, you know, that is their screen. That's the television for kids these days in the way that television when I was growing up was the primary screen. So if we look at entertainment choices, obviously kids have a variety of entertainment choices, things like watching TV, reading, and luckily for us, Mobile gaming um, comes in a close third uh, to reading here in Southeast Asia. So these numbers are actually for Southeast Asia. Um, and this is uh, kids between the ages of 6 and 14, okay? So um, all school-age children. <clears throat> and I think the only thing that would be different if you looked at this in a, a Western context is perhaps we would be ahead of reading, frankly. But here in Southeast Asia, reading is still narrowly exceeding mobile gameplay um, as an entertainment choice amongst kids. So I think that we can see the market is clearly there, okay? But what I'd like to talk about a little bit is what is the size of that market? When we look at the overall gaming market and you look at the statistics that come from uh, Nuzu, for example, last year we know that gaming revenues were about 35 to 40 billion US dollars globally, app store revenues. Um, and of that, about 7.8% went to kids or the kids category. And in the US, it was higher, about 9.3%. So I think what we can learn from this is actually the US market tends to be the most mature because that's where our app industry began. And also specifically for products targeting children, given the relative spending power and the demographics of the children's audience and the penetration of iPads in the US, I would argue that the US is the most mature market and that we can use that as a reasonable indicator of where we can expect the penetration rate of children's spending to be globally in the future. So I think that that 7.8% globally, uh, we will see increase closer to 10% plus as time goes by and children in developing countries start to spend more and more on mobile. So let's take a look at the App Store now. Um, this is, as any of you who know me, this is one of my favorite pastimes is to take a look at merchandising in the App Store because it's a good proxy to see what's going on in the market, what types of content perform well, what types of business models perform well. Um, and I'm going to focus here specifically on the US iPad App Store, um, because I think when we're thinking about children, again, this is the most mature market, and particularly the iPad on iOS makes the most sense because that's where um, the bulk of the spending is on children's entertainment. <clears throat> so if we look at the top grossing chart for iPad apps, this is top 30 chart, um, and this is from three days ago. Um, and as a side note, I spent a lot of time looking at this as I was putting th together the presentation, and I've noticed that you can actually see the rankings change in relative real time, because over the course of about a two-hour period last week, I saw the rankings changing. Um, so the, that refreshing is happening a, happening a lot more frequently than it used to. Now, if we look here, I think I want to point to two key trends. The first trend, obviously, is brands and the usage of brands. And I'll talk about that later because, obviously, that's a forte of ours as a company. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is business models. Because when we think about apps, clearly, freemium is the model that wins the day. We are all, for the most part, in the freemium business, okay? But when it comes to the children's category, um, we understand as of a couple of years ago that there were problems with the freemium model when it came to catering to kids because parents ended up with bill shock, right? So they ended up with a $5,000 bill in a month and realized, well, maybe I shouldn't have given the password to my child because five-year-olds don't know how to control their spending. Tap, 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 right? So then the backlash came to us developers because those were all refunded. Apple and Google had to settle large lawsuits, and in fact, Amazon just finally settled their part of the same suit last week. So the business model for kids gaming has actually changed. A lot of companies started to focus back to premium gaming, where there was a clear upfront price for the content. But I find the difficulty or the challenge with premium games is um, without the uh, try before you buy aspect, I personally really think it puts a cap on the potential of the product. It's a great model, but it's difficult to have the same kind of broad, widespread distribution just because asking for people for money, money up front, sight unseen, is a very, very difficult ask, I think, in the mobile ecosystem. 
So if we look here at the impact of freemium, what do we see? We see one title here, number 29, Marvel from Disney, okay? There is one freemium app in the top 30 grossing chart in the US. And if we add on top of that the other freemium chart, freemium apps, two more from Disney and one Splash Math Fun and Learning, these are actually freemium but with capped spending. So it's basically episodes. I can buy a bundle of five episodes or 10 episodes. There's a clear price demarcation so that there's a limit on the spending, okay? And if I add on top of that premium games, okay, then I can see another five titles come up which are upfront payment premium titles. So what do we have left? Subscription, okay? Subscription is the predominant model in the top grossing chart for kids today. And this has changed very quickly because we noticed this evolution towards subscription last year, about a year ago this time. And if I think back to January of this year, um, because I've discussed this before, um, in January, if you looked at this chart, 12 out of the top 30 grossing, uh, top grossing games were subscription, 12 out of 30. Here we see 21. So the difference from January until now is 12 out of 30 versus 21 out of 30. And I'm sure it will still increase over time because subscription revenue also tends to be relatively high ARPU, obviously, because the subscription prices are expensive when we think of it in the context of IAP in freemium apps, okay? Because most of the subscription products you see here are at a price point that is anywhere from two to five to 10 US dollars per month, um, and on an ARPU basis or ARPPU basis, that's pretty high. You know, it's, it's more of a mid-core sort of ARPU than it is a, a, a freemium ARPU. So thinking about this app store, the second thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is branding, okay? Because as you can see, you know, you come into the app store, first thing you see is Frozen, Dr. Panda, a little bit of Lego, um, and you see a lot of brands. So if we look back at that top grossing chart again, what is the impact of brands on those top grossing apps? Um, I think the thing I'd like to point to is the impact of offline brands. So all of these apps I've highlighted here are brands that have been built off the web and have translated into mobile success, okay? These are brands from Disney, from Nickelodeon, Viacom, et cetera. Um, things like Curious George and Barbie and Sesame Street, brands that kids know and love. And the reason that these brands are important is because parents are the consumers here. And so trust is far more important in the kids' category than it is outside of the kids' category. Because parents want to know that these types of apps and this content is gonna be safe for their kids to consume, it's going to be healthy, it's not going to take advantage of them, and it may teach them something. So this is what parents want for their kids, and they're going to spend money in the app store to reflect those values. So we see that in the importance of these brands. At the same time, the kids want what's fun, and what's fun to kids? The brands they know and love. Hence, branded Happy Meals, branded sportswear, all kinds of branded products because kids associate with and, uh, and are impacted by the value of brands. Now, if we look at the iPhone top grossing overall chart in the US, um, just for comparison, what do we see here in terms of offline brands and the impact of offline brands? We see a couple of Wizard, o Wizard of Oz social casino games, a little bit of Marvel and Star Wars and HBO, but otherwise these are all by and large brands that were created on mobile because adults can make their own decisions. They can go and download something that you know, they've never heard of before but their friend told them was a good idea, so boom, you've got Pandora and Netflix and lots of things that have been created online. But the offline brand's impact is not the same in the top grossing chart for adults. So, big brands clearly lead children's entertainment and we see a lot of products that have impact that carry those kind of brands. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the, one of the focuses of what we do um, is create those original games leveraging brands. Um, and if we see the impact in the charts, again, I picked, you know, three clear well-known corporate companies in the children's gaming sector, Disney, Nickelodeon, and Tokoboka, and you can see the overall market share in terms of number of places they take up in the different top grossing, you know, top free and uh, 
and uh, top paid charts overall. So clearly, parents are relating to those corporate brands and trusting the product that comes from those brands for their kids. And if we look at the merchandising that happens in the App Store, we see that reflected too. This is designed for families from Google. So you can see that they're actually specifically organizing their merchandising geared around those different brand silos because when kids or parents come into the App Store, they may only have something in mind that, hey, my kid is a fan of Legos or the Smurfs or Garfield, so I want to find content from that brand. Rather than keyword search, here's a way I can browse because this reminds me of going to the toy store. And if we look at Apple, we see largely the same thing because, interestingly, what you'll see here is you'll see brands kids connect to. So you can see Elmo, and you can see Dora, and you can see Thomas, which kids connect to. But you also see Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, and, uh, and various corporate brands that kids would have no affinity for. So clearly, parents are being marketed to here just as much as the kids are. So the kids' category is just as much about making that sale and that, that um, advertising approach to the parents as it is to the kids. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with is data protection. Because as I said earlier, trust is a very important thing in the kids' category, and you need to create that relationship of trust with parents. The other reason you need to do it is because it can be extremely expensive not to do it. Um, there's something in the US called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, and COPPA compliance with children's content is very important. It basically governs what types of personal information, how you handle personal information from the users, and to put it very simply, you can't take any, okay? And you have to be very careful in how you store and then uh, delete your data on a monthly basis, et cetera. The EU has similar legislation because COPPA is based on age 13 and under, uh, whereas the EU's uh, legislation has increased that age range up to the age of 16, um, although the enforcement is stronger in the US. And to leave you on a more somber note, um, violating COPPA can be extremely expensive. Um, they have the right to fine you up to 16,000 US dollars per child. So if you think about that freemium game where you're taking too, many, too much information from your users and you got 2 million downloads and then you get charged $16,000 a child, not many companies will survive that in our business. That pretty much wipes out all but five, <laughs> I would suspect. Um, so you need to be very judicious about handling personal information when it comes to children. Um, and I think that's one of the big parameters. So personal information, data privacy, um, think about your business model in terms of subscription revenue versus in-app purchase, um, and also think about how you can leverage well-known brands that connect with kids in order to build your audience. So I'd leave you with those three points. Um, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. You mentioned earlier that there are three segmentations regarding games for kids. There are games that kids play by themselves, that they play with their friends, and that they play with their families. Yes. Given that there are people worried about whether or not families are engaging with their kids. Mm -hmm. Can you say which of these segments are popular with parents? Sure. Um, I think if you go back to the top grossing chart, um, you'll see actually um, most of the ones at the very top, particularly number one, ABC Mouse, and then there are a couple others, Play Kids and Episodes. Some of them uh, are designed more for, you know, a Disney episodes, for example, is like a television experience for kids. So they can watch it by themselves or they can watch it with their friends. But something that's more edutainment oriented, like an ABC Mouse, is something that definitely can be done together with parents. And I think that's one of the reasons that they've been commercially very successful, because parents want to find ways to engage together with their kids on the screen because they realize that the tablet device is going to be a part of their kid's life, whether they like it or not. So rather than trying to force their kids not to use screens, they want to find a way to engage them so they can work together. Um, and so what you try to do in the content is build in ways that parents can not just monitor what their kids are doing in the game or in the education content, but play it with them together. Uh, question from the center and then for the front. Too late to build the brand now if you, you know? Sure. It takes these uh, brands to build for ages already. Yes. Um, I think that the low-hanging fruit is, of course, to leverage offline brands. But that doesn't mean at all that you can't build new brands. 
The perfect example of that is Tokoboka because they were the third one that I put up there and they can be considered a children's brand on mobile today, but yet the business is only a few years old. So they very successfully built an audience based on huge volume success of, of building a really large children's audience for what they call digital toys because that's their approach to building apps. Um, I think actually, frankly, it's easier to build a brand in front of children's audiences than it is in front of adults on mobile today because the UA is just far too expensive, as we all know, in the sort of traditional app store. Um, but when it comes to kids, um, focusing on children's audiences sometimes is less expensive because also the market is smaller, so there's less expectation of financial return, so the ad rates are lower. So if you can figure out how to how to get, deliver that message to parents that this is good, healthy content that can be trusted and that you as a, as a corporate sponsor, as the developer, can be trusted um, to deliver good content, then I think you can build your own brand for sure. Hey, Robbie. Thanks for the presentation. I actually have two questions. So first of all, I would like to understand if you have a view in between the Western country and Asian markets in terms mm -hmm. of the trends for the family and kids mm -hmm. category. Yeah, so if you have okay. a view in so terms of, I guess probably Asia is still kind of emerging and catching up with yes. the Western country, but yeah. is there going to be a similar trends or due to the cultural difference, there will be a different kind of emerging trends in Asia? I think there's a lot of similarity because kids of all ages love to use tablet devices. You know, YouTube for kids and streaming content for kids is extremely popular. I think actually the differences in region are going to be similar to the differences in region for other app businesses. So it's going to be distribu distribution, payment methodologies, um, brands and characters that resonate with kids, for example. Um, and while there's, I think there's less regulatory framework around kids here in Asia, for example, because there's no COPPA, right? So frankly, if you talk to big developers, they're very concerned about marketing and promotion and ad units in apps for kids in the US, but outside of the US, they're less, they're less concerned about that. Um, but I think overall, the consumption trend is similar. I think, if anything, the focus on education is a little bit stronger here in Asia um, as a theme to what the content value should be. Um, and of course, there's also a, a category of English as a second language apps, which works very well in most Asian countries that you know, is obviously not in the West. Second question is around because um, you use example of iTunes mm -hmm. for the kids category. I just wanted to understand from your perspective for yeah. two ecosystems, Google Play as well as iTunes. What do you see the biggest discrepancy? And uh, apart from the hardware itself, because iPads is a lot more popular yes. as the you know the tablet. But in terms of the ecosystem, what other kind of discrepancies you are seeing and is Android going to catch up in a way because it has uh, a lot more presence and a lot more install base going forward, especially in Asia? Sure. Um, I think that's actually not an easy question because I think it's difficult to figure out what's in the cards for Android device makers when it comes to tablets because, frankly, none of them have been especially successful. Um, and unlike the iPad, which continues to perform well amongst kids, which are, you know, whether or not Apple is happy with the success of the iPad in recent years, I think kids have remained a very strong market for them, and education specifically. Um, whereas for Android device makers, not only is it fragmented, but I don't think there's a lot of pent-up demand necessarily from consumers for new innovation in tablets. It's basically just a race to the bottom when it comes to pricing. Um, so I think that you're still going to see a variety of formats. Um, one of the challenges for developers is going to be that there are still lots of different screen sizes when it comes to Android tablet devices, whereas the iPad's a little bit more straightforward. Um, but I think Android will continue to develop, but it kind of depends on which hardware platforms people coalesce around. Is it going to be you know, branded upstarts like Xiaomi? Is it going to be incumbents like Samsung? Or is it going to be, you know, sort of white label providers, we don't really know yet. Um, yes, although I would always encourage them to do so, I just don't know that it should be a primary focus. Also because, particularly in this region, um, payment, payment methodologies have the same challenges on tablets as they do on smartphones. So obviously credit card penetration is not as high, et cetera. So um, I think you do have those challenges on Android tablets. Um, so I think 
as a good place to start, I would say, you know, iOS first, but luckily with Unity and all the various tools that we have these days, you can develop for both platforms at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a hand to Robbie Young. Great, thank you very much.